All right, in Genesis chapter 1. Now, let me just say, we've, been, we've had two classes, and we still haven't got through Genesis 1, but we will. Tonight, we will, okay? Um, but anyway, uh, we've looked at the subjects of worldview, okay? Naturalism versus theism, that's what's happening in our country. As we move away from a Judeo-Christian uh, heritage and foundation, which used to pretty be a strong, and it's still there to some degree, but uh, there's a competing worldview, naturalism, atheism, secularism. You know what? People are fanning themselves. I'm going to turn that air up a little bit, or a little down. I'm hot, too. There's no fan on, so don't worry. I meant to do that earlier. Okay, maybe that'll help. All right. So anyway, we looked at natural um, uh, worldview, and then we looked at the literary structure of Genesis. I hope you remember that that little section there of that word toledot. That's the Hebrew word, and it's, it's translated. This is the account of, or this is the story of. This is the genealogy, or the generations of. It really means this is the story of. And there are 10 sections in the book of Genesis after the creation account. Genesis 1, 1 through 2, verse 3. After that, we have 10 sections, and they're each introduced with that phrase. So it's, an, it's the most important literary uh, feature of the book of Genesis. Then we looked at the outline. where We divided Genesis up. It naturally divides into two parts. The primeval era, which means... Primeval means the earliest ages in the history of the world. And there are four major events. Creation, the fall, corruption, catastrophe, the flood, and, and uh, confusion, the Tower of Babel. And in between several of those, we have two genealogies. From Adam to Noah, from Noah to Abraham. So that's the primeval era. And then... Chapters 12 through 50, the patriarchal era. Four major patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Very important that we understand the Abrahamic covenant. And then we looked at the reliability of the Genesis record. It's trustworthiness. It's reliable. And I believe it's reliable. And it is reliable because of the author. Right? God. God is the author. Not Moses, God. He used Moses, but um, we trust it because God is the author and he was the only one there. Only one there. No one now was anywhere, nowhere near there. So they can just look at the earth and they can make their guesses. Just keep that in mind, and that's what they are, guesses. And then we looked at the unifying theme of the Bible, the big story, the mega narrative, the story, the narrative, the mega narrative, the big story of the Bible, the unifying theme, and that is the kingdom of God. And Genesis 1 and 2 is the kingdom was created, a realm and a ruler. God created Adam to subdue the earth and rule over it, it and it was a theocracy, God's rule through man on the earth. And then we saw the, or then the second part is the, king, the kingdom's corruption. Chapter 3, where Adam rebelled against the creator. He turned, he turned his responsibility and gave up the rule of this earth to Satan. And then God made a promise, the kingdom ruler. Um, one is going to come, the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. Even though the serpent will bruise his heel. And then the kingdom restoration, and um, uh, that is right here. There, there's the, the, that is the outline of the, that is the unifying theme of the Bible, that where everything is working toward, that is Revelation 21 and 22. And I like this statement by Jim Showers, who was just with us this past Sunday. 
Dr. Jim Showers from Friends of Israel, for God to be sovereign over all, he must put down the rebellion of his creation against him. Remove the rebellious ones. And by the way, by the time we get to Revelation 21 and 22, where the new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven onto the earth, right? God dwells with man. Um, let me get to that passage here. In Revelation 21, we, we find this statement. He's going to remove the rebellious ones. It says, uh, let's see if I can find it. Yeah. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, will, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. All rebels will be removed. Not only that, he, will re, he must reinstate an Adam-like representative to rule over his kingdom. That's the Lord, Jesus. He's the last Adam. And he must restore his kingdom on the earth. And that's what Jesus taught us to pray, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth, just as it is done in heaven. And that is going to occur... That is going to occur... Right um, in the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, your millennial kingdom, transitioning into the eternal kingdom. That's when that is going to happen. Now let me go down here. Restore his kingdom on the earth. Exactly how God is working out the restoration of his kingdom on earth is the unifying theme of the Bible. It's really important to know. It fits it's the story. And Israel, God's selection of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, right? Israel, the Jewish people, are the conduit through which God is going to bring this Adam-like representative into our world and is going to bless those people. And they, through you, Abraham, all peoples of the earth are going to be blessed. And that's not only in the first coming of the Lord, but the second coming, the millennial kingdom, and even into the eternal state. They are God's chosen people, and that never ceases. And that, all that means is that through them, all of us are blessed and are going to be. All right. Now we're going to go into Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And... Uh, we're going to look at this matter of repetition. There are four phrases that God repeats over and over in Genesis 1, 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. And we're going to look at those phrases in a little bit more depth. Let me see if I can get this going. A little bit more depth. Hey, how did that picture get in there? That Nancy, I'm telling you, she's going to... She's going to get disciplined when I get home. How did that get in there? That's Monday night on Cory Lake, just north of here. Bill Flora took the picture. Huh? That's a northern pike. A northern pike. There, yeah. <laughs> Biggest one I ever caught right out of Cory Lake. What did I do with it? You don't want to know, Wanda. No, <laughs> no, I let him go. Or her, whatever it is. I let her go, him go. So anyway, Nancy, boy, she is in trouble sticking, a, mess, messing up my PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll go back. I mean, she's in big trouble. All right. Four phrases. The first phrase that appears over and over in Genesis 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, is the phrase... And or then God said, followed by, and it was, oh, uh -oh. <laughs> now I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm not afraid of her. <laughs> okay, so 
and or then God said, followed by, and it was so. Okay? And that phrase is repeated nine times in chapter 1. Or, or the phrase, and or then God said, nine times. And the phrase, and it was so, appears seven times in those verses. So that's an important phrase. It's there. It's repetition. In other words, it, the emphasis is God said, right? And it happened. Right. That's, in, that's really important to notice because God is emphasizing it. And there's a reason why he's emphasizing it. Anyway, these phrases are repeated to us that merely by speaking and commanding, God brought all things into being. For example, I wrote three verses down. Yeah, right there. I'll just share them with you. Psalm 33, verse 6, and verses 8 through 9. Listen to what it says. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host, by the breath of his mouth. By the way, that's an interesting phrase, because in 2 Timothy it says, every writing, all scripture is what? God breathed, inspired, inspired, God breathed, Theop Nustos. It means God breathed. So that's, that's what it's saying. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. What about the next one, Psalm 148, 1 through 5? Here's what it says. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord. Why? For he commanded, and they were created. And then Hebrews, New Testament, chapter 11, verse 3 says, Now faith, well, yeah, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand, isn't that interesting? By faith we understand that the world, that the universe was formed at God's command. Now, I was not there six to, six to 10 or 12,000 years ago. I wasn't there, right? Neither was anyone else, okay? So how do we know this? We know it because of what God's word says. By faith. Believing what God says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen is, was not made out of what was visible. In other words, this is called, I don't know if you ever heard this phrase, creation ex nihilo. A Latin term meaning out of nothing. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Creation out of nothing, ex nihilo. And we understand how the universe was formed and how this earth was formed, not by sight, because no one was there, but by faith in God's word, in the author who wrote this word. That's how we understand it. So, that phrase is important, and God is emphasizing it in chapter 1. Emphasizing, God said, and it was so. All right. Let's come now to the second phrase, um, and that is another phrase that appears throughout uh, this passage, Genesis chapter 1, is the phrase, according to its kind or according to their kinds. Right? And it appears ten times in chapter 1. In verse 11, twice in verse 12, twice in verse 21, twice in verse 24, and three times in verse 25. 
according to their kinds. Now, why is this emphasized? Well, I think, let me just share this with you. The Bible teaches the supernatural creation of all things in six literal earth rotation days by God. Okay? So what does that mean? What are the implications of that? Well, <coughs> this means that each basic, that's point number A now for the fill-in, it means that each basic category of life appeared abruptly. Each basic category of life, the dog kind, the, the cat or the feline kind, the uh, horse kind, the, you know, whatever. There are various kinds. And they appeared abruptly. God said, and it was so. <coughs> so, each basic category of life appeared abruptly without descending from an ancestor of a different sort. Okay? Now, it's interesting, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you want to go over there with me, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul emphasizes this when he talks about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 39. Well, let's read at verse 38. It starts with the word but. we got to go to verse 37. Okay, 1537. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. There are different kinds of seeds, right? Yeah, because there's different kinds of plants. Okay, but God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh. Animals have another. Birds, another. Fish, another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And star differs from star in splendor. So that's the point that's being emphasized here. There, and not only that is that they appear abruptly, but much variation within, within a category, a family, a kind is expected. We know this, don't we, now? In science, I mean good science. We believe in the scientific method. Okay, We benefited a lot from it. But the scientific me method is very rigid, and it has to do with testing and observation. The, the point is this, that we know from genetics that within each kind, there's a, within the genetic code, there's lots of variation. That's why people look different, right? There are different kinds of skin. I mean, it's basically, basically all the same skin, but... It's different pigmentation, right? Different amount of uh, a particular chemical that gives it. There's different eye shapes. There's different um, hair kinds. There's different. There's all kinds of different things. There's an infinite variety in the genetic code, but the kind stays the kind. There are big dogs, little dogs, dogs with lots of fur, dogs with really short hair, curly hair, straight hair. Um, all kinds of variety, and there's even probably more variety within, within the kind. But dogs are dogs, and they will always be dogs, because that's how God created them. This is what we call, this has a term for it, it's called stasis. Stasis. Which means, it means it stands. It stands. It remains static stationary. Though there's infinite variety within the kind, yet the kind is the kind. 
and it doesn't become another kind. That's what it means, stasis. There's humankind. There's the dog kind or the dog family, the canine family. There's the, whatever that third one is, frogs, you know, or whatever the kind is. But there's infinite variety in color and size and shape and unique features and so forth. There's the horse kind. There's the, you know, the plant kind and flowers. There's different flowers. And there's variety within each flower, all kinds of roses. But they're roses. So this is an important concept. Um, and stasis means, it says, th th there's much variation within a category or kind is expected, but each possessed genetic limits to its variability. There are limits. And thus exhibit stasis. The tendency of types of organisms to remain unchanged over time, static or stationary with respect to evolutionary progress. It's not the way God created it. And, we are, and that is the emphasis of that phrase, according to its kind. Now, point B, evolution is the idea. It's a totally secular, godless idea, but evolution is the idea that all of life has descended from a common ancestor through a process of modification over time, lots of time. All life descended from a single-celled organism which arose spontaneously from non-living chemicals that has never been observed, ever. Scientifically, it has never been observed. Changes occurred through natural processes, including mutation, natural selection, and genetic recombination. Uh, that, is the, that is the theory of uh, evolution. From a single cell, whatever, I mean, from a, from, a, from a, I don't know. But life came to be, although that has never been witnessed. And it's not scientific. They can't make it happen, never seen it. So it's a theory, even though you're forced to believe it. Doesn't matter. Um, but there's a huge problem with this idea. There's a huge problem. What's the problem? Okay, yeah, but there's a problem. I mean, a real problem. Right, there's no transitional forms. You know, the fossil record, by the way, the fossil record is where they get all this idea. Right, right. That's right. The fossil record gives no support to the concept of descent of all life from a common ancestor. There's no support. If evolution were true, one would expect to find an abundance of transitional forms. The reality is there are none. None. Listen to Dr. Henry Morris from the Creation Institute of Creation Research. Listen to this statement that he makes. It's very interesting. This, what I just explained to you, there are the problem, there are no transitional forms. You'd expect to find them if this is how, every, if, how it all happened. You'd expect to find lots of them. There are none. This is, without a doubt, a fascinating time to be a Bible-believing Christian. Today, we can watch as the concept of evolution self-destructs. It has never been well supported by the evidence and now many scientists, and Dr. Morris is a scientist. He has an earned PhD, by the way, multiple PhDs, in, from credible schools in geology and other disciplines of the science. He's a scientist, and many are. Many have recognized the total inability of chance, random processes, to produce the incredible complexity we see around us especially in living systems. Now, this is an interesting statement. Students of Earth history have abandoned 
the creed of former decades that the present is the key to the past. That's called uniformitarianism. The processes we see in force today have always been the same processes and have operated at the same rate. That's a, that's a, that's a theory. That's an assumption. Uniformitarianism, the present is the key to the pact. That has been abandoned, and they are proposing instead secular theories of past events which sound almost biblical in their proportions. I'm going to show you them right here. Here's, here they are. There's, first of all, you know, we believe in catastrophism. You say, what do you, what do you mean by catastrophism? What I mean by catastrophism is this. We believe that these are the five worlds of history, science, and prophecy, and after Genesis 1, when Genesis 1 ended, there was something that happened that was, that was a utter catastrophe. What was that? No, not yet. The fall, Genesis 3. That was huge. That was probably the biggest catastrophe that's ever occurred on the planet. Because that little box up there, that led to where we're at now. You understand? I would say that was pretty catastrophic, would you? Yeah. Death entered the world. The whole earth and the universe was put under a curse. The, all of creation, Paul says, is groaning groaning under in its bondage to decay. It, is, it was a catastrophe that we all live with every single day of our lives. The diseases, the hurt, the aging, the death that knows no age limit, the, the brutality of people against one another, the fact that we're all sinners, all that we observe in this fallen world and the curse that we're under, that was a huge catastrophe. Then, then after a number, of, after about a, a millennium and a half or more, um, we had a second tremendous catastrophe. What was that? The flood, global. And I mean, it changed. The, the old earth, the earth before, perished. In so many ways, the earth was changed. The surface of the earth was changed. The, the climate was changed. Um, every, things were changed. In fact, it was so devastating that a lot of animals afterward, particularly dinosaurs, uh, and by the way, not only big, big ones, they didn't survive after the flood, only for a while. The, the temperatures and everything were, are so different, and life on this planet now. Then there's coming a future time when there's going to be another tremendous catastrophe. What's that? The Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation. Unless those days are shortened, no flesh would survive. The Great Tribulation, when the seal judgments, the bowl judgment, the trumpet judgment, and the bowl judgments will be poured out on the inhabitants of this earth. And then, after a thousand year of millennial kingdom, then there's going to come another catastrophe, and that is that the Bible says that the earth and the elements are going to melt in intense heat. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So we believe in catastrophism, right? The Bible teaches catastrophism. Not uniformitarianism over millions and billions of years. The Bible doesn't teach that, doesn't allow for it. No, we believe in catastrophism. Well, catastrophism, then there's uniformitarianism, which means time and chance. Just give us enough time, enough chance, and people, well, that was so long, I guess anything could happen over millions and billions of years. Although it's never been observed. And there's no evidence. And then, here's the, here's the theory, though, that almost biblical in, in proportions, here's one thing they've come up with. It's called neo-catastrophism. Neo, N-E-O, C-A-T-A-S-T-R-O-P-H-I-S-M. Catast Neo-catastrophism, a new form of catastrophism. And here's what they say. These are secular people. Natural catastrophes occurred in the past. Uniformitarianism has been abandoned. 
natural catastrophes occurred in the past, which, while of great intensity and scale, were no different in character from processes possible today, like earthquakes, volcanoes, um, you know, whatever. There are catastroph catastrophic things that occur today. But these were of in great intensity and scale. Um, these catastrophes were episodic, episodic, however you say that, separated by long periods of uniformity. So in other words, it was a period of uniformity. And in order to get to the next thing, there had to be some kind of a catastrophe to explain it. Neocatastrophism. That almost sounds biblical. That's what the point he's making. Here's another one. Macroevolution. Macroevolution. Macroevolution is a secular uh, construct to explain the, the common descent from a single cell. Large hypothetical changes which occur in an individual or in a population of organisms which produce an entirely new category or novel trait. It happens how? Like that. Macroevolution, never been observed. But they got to... What they propose from the past doesn't make, there's no, there's no evidence of this. It's, it's, it's falling apart. So they come up with these ideas of large hypothetical, hypothetical changes, hypothetical, which occur in an individual or in a population of organisms which produce an entirely new category. So we jump to the next level. That sounds biblical in its proportions. And then there's one last one, punctuated equilibrium. This is macroevolution on a rapid pace, rapid pace now. It's invoked to explain and allow for evolution in the absence of fossil transitional forms. That's why there's no transitional forms, because of macroevolution and punctuated equilibrium, that macroevolution on a quick, rapid pace. Although none of this has been observed, or anything like this. So, this, this is why that phrase number two, God put it in there, according to its kind. Stasis. God created the kinds. And whether it's plants, or trees, or stars, or planets, or people, or dogs, or cats, or whatever, Whatever the family of the, the um, you know, the category, the kind, God created them out of nothing, and they created great variability, but there is genetic limit, though there's vast variability in the, within the kind. So that's what that, that phrase is saying, and it's emphasized ten times. Then here's the third phrase. There was evening and there was morning the first day, the second day, the third day. It appears six times, remember six days of creation, on the seventh God ceased, rested, he stopped. All right, there was evening, there was morning. This phrase appears six times. Genesis 1, 1 through chapter 2, verse 4 seem to say that God created the universe, the earth, the sun, moon, and stars, plants and animals, and the first two people within six ordinary earth rotation days. Prior to the 19th century, the dominant view in the Christian world of Eastern and Western Europe and North America was that God created the world in six 24-hour days. prior to the 19th century. In the late 18th century, we're talking there now about 1790s, late 18th century, different histories of the earth began to be developed and popularized. And I'll tell you how they came about, and this is, I'll tell you how they came about. They came about by people that looked at the 
rock layers, the, you know, the various, um, what do you call that, sedimentary rock layers. By the way, what is sedimentary rock? It's, 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 it's sand and silt laid down by water. That's what sedimentary rock is. But anyway, they look at these things and they say each of those layers that you can see took tens of thousands of years to form, each of the layers. And in these layers and in all this rock, from the bottom all the way to the top, what, are they, what do they find? Lots of them. Marine fossils. Millions, billions of fossils within these layers. But their idea is what, what we see here is millions, even billions of years of formation of the earth and so forth. And death and disease and killing and thorns and struggle and suffering and extinction within, within this. That's where, that's where the whole theory of evolution came from. It came from rocks and fossils and layers of sediment. That's how it originated. And it's still based on that today. So <clears throat> different histories of the Earth began to be developed and popularized, which were evolutionary and naturalistic in nature. By this, I mean these theories sought to explain the origin and history of physical reality by appealing only to time, chance, and the laws of nature working on matter. God was denied or at least left out of the picture in constructing a history of the earth. But here's the problem, folks. Ever since that time, 1790s, right up to the present, ever since, the length, because of that and because of secular history of the earth and their theories, the length of the days of creation, you understand what I'm saying? The first day, the second, the length of the days of creation has been a major controversy in biblical interpretation among evangelicals for over 150 to 200 years. Many have sought to redefine the term in light of the naturalistic presuppositions of recent evolutionary theory. Um, and I want to show you this. I want to show you this. Let me see if, it, yeah. Here's those theories. And there's all kinds of them. You know, there's the local flood theory. There's theistic evolution, which basically means God guided the whole process of evolution over, over millions and billions of years. God guided the whole thing. God, was, God made the initial explosion 15 billion years ago. God guided the whole thing. So that's theistic evolution. There's the day-age theory, that every, each one of these days represents myriads of time, millions of years. There's progressive creationism, which, by the way, is the same thing as the day-age theory, but what progressive creationists say. That's why there's no transitional forms, because all of a sudden, boom, 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 we, have, we go to the next level. God did that. There's the gap theory. The gap theory is this right here. Between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, we have millions or billions of years, geologic ages, Lucifer's flood, and not only that, but we have a whole, uh, all these, all these semi-human forms that they so-called find. Um, they didn't have a soul or anything. All the before Adam would, ever came along, before Adam and Eve ever came along. That's where, all, that's where they fit all this between Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2. Of course, it doesn't fit there. But where do you fit all this stuff? Where do you fit the millions of years? You know, between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, do you spread it out over the six days? That's progressive creationists, the, theistic evolutionists, and day-age theory people. The Bible doesn't allow for it. Well, where do you put it? Somewhere. You reinterpret the words, you know, to mean what you want to say, what you want them to say. And because they started, Christians, evangelicals started to do that, 
You have the Bible, God's perfect word, the author who inspired it, and you have man's fallible opinion. Fallible means not trustworthy. And when people try to make them agree, man's theories and the Bible, they try to fit the secular explanation, and they try to make it fit in the Bible. Guess which one gets modified? The Bible does, right? The Bible gets destroyed. So I think we're on the... Yeah, point C. Ever since, I already said this one, the length of the days of creation has been a major controversy. Many have sought to redefine, that's the word, in term, in light of the naturalistic presuppositions of recent evolutionary theory. Those who argue that the word day means a long geological age of millions of years point out that the Hebrew word yom can have a number of meanings, only one of which is a 24-hour day. And it's true. The word day can have a variety of meanings. That's true. For example, look at Genesis 1.5. There are Genesis 1.5. It says this. God called the light. Remember light and darkness? God called the light portion what? Day. And the darkness he called the night. And there was evening and there was morning. The first day. So the word day is used in two ways there, right? It's used of the light part of the day. And it's used of the whole 24-hour earth rotation time. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's used like this all the time. There's different, different ways a word is used. Here's one. Let me show you this one. I think I'm on the right. I got so many of these things. Oh, yeah, here. Here's an English sentence. Back in my father's day... It took 10 days to drive across the Australian outback during the day. In other words, at night they rested, right? They didn't drive 24 hours. They drove during the day. So there's three ways the word day is used. Back in my father's day, it took 10 days to drive across the Australian outback during the day. Yeah, the word day has to be... Um, um, Webster's 20th century unabridged dictionary, the English language, can have up to 14 definitions of the word day. You have to, the context determines it. The context determines it. So what about the, the Hebrew word yom? You see it there? Let me put this up here. The Hebrew word yom. Day is used 2,300 times. It's the word yom. You, I put it in there. And it can have a number of meanings, only one of which is a 24-hour day. And it's true. That's true. It's the immediate context and usage elsewhere in other contexts that determine which of these is intended by the writer. The word day appears this many times and almost always means a literal 24-hour earth rotation day. And I put some things down there how the word day is used outside of Genesis. Is everyone following me? I mean, here, here. Here's how it's used. For example, uses of the word day outside of Genesis chapter 1. The word day with, with a number. You know what I mean? Like the fourth day or the 24th day or the whatever. Use of the word day with a number outside of Genesis 410 times. Okay? So... It always means an ordinary day when used with a number. Make sense? Always, 410 times. Always means a 24-hour earth rotation day. What about the phrase evening and morning together without the word day? Just evening and morning. Used 38 times outside of Genesis. Always means an ordinary day outside of Genesis in the Bible. The evening and the morning. We know what that is, don't we? Right. Here's another one. The word evening or the word morning together with the word day. 23 times. And it always means an ordinary day. 
And then one last one. The word night with the word day. Night and day. 52 times outside of Genesis, it always means an ordinary 24-hour day. And so this is what God has given us in Genesis chapter 1. We have the word night, we have the word morning and evening, we have the first day with a number. We have in the evening and the morning with the second day, the evening and the morning, the third day, the evening and the morning, the fourth. And um, by the way, not only do we see that, but we also notice from Exodus chapter 20, what does that say? Why? Remember the Sabbath day, remember that? Six days you will do what? Work. And the seventh you will rest. Yeah, and then why, do we, why is that cycle going on, that seven-day cycle? Because here's why. For in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So those, that verse in Exodus 31, another place, clearly defined how Yom is to be understood in Genesis 1. It's just very plain. You say, oh, now we got you, Pastor. What about uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8? Well, before I put that one up, look at this. We know that all scripture is inspired by God, but Exodus 20, this scripture was inscribed by God. Right? In the Ten Commandments. Well, what, well, what about... Um, what about 2 Peter? Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Oh, no, I want to get rid of that. I'm sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't, turn, I couldn't turn back. Okay. I really couldn't. That was a mistake. The first one wasn't. She's still in trouble, but even though... You know, Peter says, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Uh-oh, that means that the Genesis chapter 1, that each of the days are a thousand years. Well, first of all, that wouldn't help them anyway, because why? Because they need a lot more than a thousand years per day, right? Millions of years for each of them. But anyway, but you know Peter, what Peter goes on to say there? What does he go on to say? But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and what? And a thousand years is as one day. Why don't we do that same with the other? In other words, is Peter giving a definition of how many long a day is? What, what is Peter saying there? Yeah, God is God. God is God. He is not limited the time a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years are at a day you know in other words it that doesn't matter to the lord right that's all he's saying and if we take what peter says a thousand a day is as a thousand years then jonah was three thousand years in the whale i mean come on now you know this is just a goofy argument that's not what peter's doing here it doesn't have anything to do with Genesis chapter 1. And it doesn't even work anyway in their scheme. It's just, it's just foolish, really. Some very smart people bring this up, too. Okay, I'm just trying to say to you that God makes it very clear in his word. Does he not? God makes it very clear. He stressed this. There was evening. Oh, God called the light day, and he called the darkness the night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And then the evening and morning, the second day. You know, it's just very clear. I like what, what Dr. Paddle P.T. Pun, Pun from Wheaton College years ago, years ago said about this. He, at least he was honest. He said this, it's apparent that the most straightforward understanding of Genesis record 
without regard to all of the hermeneutical considerations suggested by science, is that God created heaven and earth in six solar days, period. That's what, that's what it says. Okay, we're going to move on from that. That's another phrase. That's a third phrase that's repeated, and that is, there was evening and there was morning, the first day, second day, third day. So we take that as it is. Now, the last one is this. God saw that it was good. That appears six times in 4, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, but the six-day creation week ends with the summary evaluation found in verse 31. And what's that? God saw that the first, the six days, and then what does it say in verse 31? It says it was very good, right. Now that it was complete, with every part in perfect harmony with every other part, all perfectly formed and filled with an abundance of inhabitants, God saw that, that it all was very good. This one verse, folks, this one verse is sufficient to refute any attempt to harmonize the Genesis account of creation with the accepted system of geologic ages and its teaching of millions, even billions of years for the age of the earth. Because fossils, billions of them, embedded in the sedimentary rock layers all over the earth, even as high as the top of Mount Everest, there are marine fossils, thousands of them, Fossils, billions of them embedded in the sedimentary rock layers all over the earth, speak of pain, death, killing, disease, thorns, struggle, suffering, and extinction. How do you ter interpret the fossil record? Well, there's three ways you can, you can do it. And I'm gonna, we're going to end with this. Let me see if I can uh, get this again. Oh, yeah. There's three ways you can interpret the fossil record. Number one, A, you can reject, reject the Genesis record, and you can embrace naturalism. Natural causes alone, not along, but alone are sufficient to explain everything that exists. So this is just simply wrong. It's untrustworthy. It's just, it's just a fairy tale. You can reject the Genesis record and embrace naturalism. Natural causes alone are sufficient to explain everything that exists. But be, be aware that by rejecting Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, and really Genesis 1 through 11, you can't trust anything else in the Bible. Because if this can't be trusted, if this is all wrong, then what about the rest of it? On what basis is that dependable, but this is not? Here's a second way you can do it. Point B, you can accept the Genesis record as sober history, as the divinely revealed history of creation and corruption and catastrophe and confusion. And that is our position. Our position as a church. We accept God's word. And then thirdly, you can try to harmonize the Genesis record of creation with the accepted system of geological ages and its teaching of millions of years for the age of the earth. But that point, C, will not work. And the reason is this. In, the, in these sedimentary rock layers, which they say represent, each layer represents a long time, I think that, not only I think, but scientists, biblical scientists, geologists, that was created by the flood all over the earth. These things are formed quickly. By the way, let me ask you, let me ask you what this is a picture of. No, this was formed by the explosion of Mount St. Helens and all the lava and rock and all of a sudden that came pouring down that mountain at 600 and some miles an hour or whatever it was, the, the, the impact of the explosion in 198 of Mount St. Helens created a little Grand Canyon for miles around. 
And this was formed in a matter of hours. See all those layers? Formed in a matter of hours. As one wave of junk came and came upon. And, and, and then it was all cut out with water. The la all the lakes that were there and formed and that stuff came down, pushed that water and the water came down and cut out these canyons in the soft mud that was still there. Mount St. Helens is a tremendous testimony to how the flood affected the earth and formed the Grand Canyon. So, well, anyway, the point is this. The point I'm going to make, and, and then I'm done, because Nancy warned me to be done by 8 o'clock. No, she really did. She says, you're ending too late. There are nursery people downstairs. And she's correct. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to find that one picture. Just a minute, and then, yeah, there it is. So my point is this. Why won't that, why, why can't we fit the Bible into that in the days? You know why? Where does, where does pain, death, killing, disease, thorns, struggle, suffering, extinction, where does that come from? Where, it comes from Adam, right? And his rebellion against God. All of this stuff, Death came into the world because of Adam's sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, it is by one man that sin entered into the world, and death as a result of sin. And death passed upon all men because... And yet there are those that are trying to tell us that Adam came later, but all of this preceded it. It denies the scriptures. All of this, all... Sin and suffering and death comes be because of man's rebellion and the curse of sin because of Adam's disobedience. Do, do you see the point? Okay, look at this. Death entered the world when sin came in through man. Point two, do you believe God's word? If the Genesis record is not historically trustworthy, then neither is the rest of the Bible, including its testimony about Christ. Do you, know what, do you know what Jesus said to the Pharisees of his day and the Jewish leaders? He said this, John 5, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Don't think I will accuse you. Your accuser is going to be Moses, uh, on whom your hopes are set. You know, they go back to Moses and the law. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? That's true. That's true. That's true. If this is not trustworthy, then neither is the rest of the Bible. So, that's my study of Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. And next week, we're going to get into the first Toledoth section where it says, this is the story of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Now we're going to start honing down into the Garden of Eden, the creation of man, the creation of woman, the first marriage, and the fall. Okay? Yeah, Dave. You know, I'm not, yeah, that's true. But I'm not worried about the naturalists. You know what I'm worried about? You know what really ticks me off? Is Christians that try to make, that try to force this, for the sake of being relevant and accepted and not persecuted, whatever their reason, but trying to make the Bible fit that. That's what ticks me off. I'm not worried about them that. They can have their atheistic beliefs. That's just who they are. They need to know the Lord, and I hope they do. But the, it's, it's evangelical Christians that try to force the Bible. Evolution theory doesn't suffer. The Bible suffers, and Christians do. Let's pray. Thank you, Father for our study in this important passage and this important book of the Bible. We're thankful that we've laid a good foundation, and as we begin to move into the, these various chapters, we ask your blessing upon our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.